In the previous video, we have dealt with the JFET as a first field effect transistor type. Already in the 1920s, the basics for field effect transistors were created by Julius Edgar Lilienfeld. However, it should take until November 1959 to build the first working MOSFET. In the beginning, the MOSFET was lower and more expensive compared to the bipolar transistor. But due to continuous development, especially the introduction of the CMOS process, its use increased more and more. From the 1970s, the use of the MOSFET in integrated circuits became more widespread. Today's modern processors have billions of them on an area of a few square millimeters. In this video, we want to take a brief look at how these miracles of modern technology work. Welcome to today's video on types of transistors. Finally, we arrive at the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, or simply MOSFET. As the name suggests, it also uses a field for its operation similar to the JFET. But the MOSFET is an entirely different beast. A large portion of transistors built today are MOSFETs, as they are the go-to transistors for many digital circuits. So, let's see what's inside and how the MOSFET behaves in a circuit. The MOSFET consists of three doped regions. Two wells are placed into a bulk of semiconducting material of opposite doping. For example, we could put two N-doped regions into a P-doped semiconductor. Similar to the JFET, the contacts of the N-doped regions are called drain and source. Between these two contacts, the current is conducted. But as we can see, Either way, one of the involved PN junctions or diodes is reverse biased and thus no current can flow through our MOSFET. We could try to operate the MOSFET like a bipolar transistor by contacting and biasing the P-doped region of the device. The corresponding contact would be the bulk, as it is connected to the big bulky part of the transistor. But then, we would just end up with a really bad bipolar transistor. So we have to figure something out. We could try to connect the two regions of drain and source somehow. This could be done by transforming portions of the p-doped bulk material into something that has similar charge carrier densities as n-doped material. This means we have to increase the number of electrons while removing holes. And a very simple and effective way to do that is applying an electric field in the right direction. For our example here, the electric field pushes electrons up in between drain and source while pushing holes away. If we move sufficiently enough charge carriers, a channel is formed which connects drain and source. The required electric field can easily be applied by an electrode placed above the channel. This electrode and its contact are called gate similar to the JFET again. But we have to make sure the gate is insulated from the channel. Otherwise, we could have just created a second bulk contact. To ensure this insulation, we place a non-conducting layer in between channel and gate. This layer is typically made of some oxide, like silicon dioxide. With this, we got ourselves a perfectly operating MOSFET. And if you have been wondering, MOS or metal oxide semiconductor is of course referring to the sequence of layers above the channel. And of course, there are again two types of MOSFET to choose from. There is the N-channel MOSFET we just talked about and its twin cousin, the P-channel MOSFET. Nice, we build a MOSFET. But how does it behave? As usual, Let's take a look on our characteristics. Just like the bipolar transistor and the JFET, there are several characteristics given the behavior of the MOSFET. There are the input characteristic, the transfer characteristic, the output characteristic, and the current gain. The gate is insulated from the rest of the transistor, and for our investigations, we can assume no current is flowing into the gate. 
This means there is no meaningful input characteristic and we can move on. The same goes for the current gain, since there is no current flowing into the transistor. The transfer characteristic is where things get interesting. It tells us how the gate source voltage, VGS, impacts the drain current, ID. At 0 volt gate source voltage, no drain current is flowing. Only if we increase VGS above the so-called threshold voltage, VTH, the transistor starts to conduct current. This is expected, as we have to create this electric field from before, which of course requires some voltage. After dealing with the bipolar transistor and the JFET, the output characteristic of a MOSFET holds little to no surprise for us. The output characteristic again shows how the drain current is influenced by the drain source voltage. And just as before, there is an infinite number of output characteristics. Which one is active is again determined by the gate source voltage. Just like the other two transistor types, the characteristics field of the MOSFET can be divided into different regions of operation, in which the transistor has different properties. They are the cutoff region, the linear region, and the saturation region. Also, for the MOSFET should be noted that the input and output designations are only conventions to describe the behavior and is totally unrelated to any circuit's input and output. Of course, we can connect the transistor in any way we want to. This video concludes our short series on transistor types with the MOSFET. There would be much more to tell, but we wanted to give a short overview of three important examples of these electrical components. I'm Christoph with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyways, thanks for watching.